Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 29th of April, um, 2015. It is uh, one hour until curfew in uh, Baltimore. Um, <laughs> I, but, um, and we have, I don't mean to make light of that, um, but uh, th we have, I've asked some people to come talk about Black Lives Matter, come talk about what's going on in Baltimore, um, come talk about what we're doing in our classrooms, and um, there is an educator, and I, you'll have to introduce yourself, Jay, a little bit, but um, sure. I, I think you're a principal now, or at least you started a school called the Stadium School and um, published a book called um, Educating for the Insurgency. Um, that school is in Baltimore, and I thought, wow, I've wanted to talk to Jay, so after I read your book, I just read it last month. Um, and loved it. Um, so uh, you are also the leader of the Algebra Project in Baltimore, I think, or the something. Again, you can use your own language around all of that. Um, and uh, so here we are. I don't know exactly where this is going to go, but um, some might describe an insurgency happening right now in Baltimore and around Black Lives Matter in general. And then what are we doing ab about that in our classrooms? Um, I think that's generally the idea. But um, before we get to, well, Jay, go ahead. Why don't you introduce yourself a little bit more, if you don't mind? Okay. Welcome okay. to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Thank you very much. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, it's really exciting to be part of this conversation. Thank you very, very much for inviting me. Um, let me clear up a couple of misconceptions first. Um, sure. Please don't accuse me of being a principal. Okay. <laughs> I'm not and never have been. Um, I did work with a group of people uh, to start um, a community teacher-run school, public school, um, under the Baltimore City System 21 years ago. And I was the first teacher director of that school, um, and I we, we cycled, so I did three years, and then another teacher did three, and so on. Um, that was 90, 94, um, and um, I was uh, looking for a math curriculum. We didn't have, I, I was an English teacher, we didn't have a math teacher for the, for the school that was starting. The first year was just 80 students. It was a big organizing project because the school system um, at that time, you know, there were there were no charters, there were no sort of non-system schools, and uh, non-bureaucratically run schools. So this was a fight in a predominantly black community to have a school that was controlled by the community, um, and it was a big it was a big uh, organizing effort. But we we won it, um, and so there was no math teacher. And I said, I like math, I'll do math, and I got involved with. Um, the uh, algebra project because I was trying to find a um, a curriculum and a pedagogy that was uh, designed specifically with black students in mind um, and so that led to a many years um, well uh, the past 21 years um, relationship with the algebra project as a as an idea and organizing um, a strategy uh, and so I've been mostly uh, in the classroom during that time. For a short time, I was uh, called the school systems, uh, Baltimore City's facilitator for the Algebra Project. But it's a student-run organization, and um, so um, I have no operational authority in the organization. I um, uh, occasionally give uh, advice as time goes on less and less, and... Uh, the oldest person in, in the organization is 23 right now. Um, they do the um, contracts with schools to pay themselves, um, negotiations with schools and funders. They do the hiring, training, and, um, and evaluation of, of uh, it's a tutoring study group uh, organization in, in, for math after school mostly, but sometimes during the school day. They do the bookkeeping, everything. Um, so um, they're very, very independent. And just, just this evening, they were leading a several thousand person demonstration in Baltimore. And um, 
uh, they prepared for it last night, and um, I knew they were doing a demonstration tonight, but I was expecting there were going to be a, a couple hundred people, so um, I wasn't there. It's like this is a completely, completely, utterly youth-run thing. My role is really at this point to um, so, to be supportive. So that's great. I, I I hope we get to tell more of that story because you know there's too much negative stories about youth in Baltimore right now. So it's great to hear some some of this positive. And and when you said that there are demonstrations that you knew there were they were going to do a demonstration, it so, sounds like this is not unusual that they do that they demonstrate that they are active. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean, I could get into that now, you know, if you want. I don't know what the what what sort yeah, of. Yeah, well, let's I let's hear from everyone else first, and then great. We'll need, great, but thank you. Yeah. Sure. Um, Jay, are you teaching now still, or? Yeah, I I, I teach math. Um, I'm a, I'm a math teacher. I I got um, kicked out of the school I really wanted to be in um, a couple of years ago. I had been there for uh, quite a while. Um, and they moved me to one school and then another school, so I'm in uh, a new school this year. Right. And your book, um, Educating for Insurgency, uh, just came out in September. Um, is that correct? I think yes. that's right. Uh -huh. um, and if you go, is it Gillen? Gillen? Gillen, yeah. Gillen. Yeah. So yeah. if you go to jgillen.org, you can find out about the book, by the way. Just, uh, just to, uh, Yeah, um, actually, uh, jgillen.net is uh, how to get there, yeah. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, so let's quickly do other introductions. Janae, welcome. Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Janae. I am the gifted resource teacher at um, Colonial Forge High School in Stafford, Virginia, um, where I'm also the service learning coordinator. And uh, that's me. Today, I um, w I don't know if you noticed, but we did a couple of shows over the past month um, on rural education. Yeah. And I was wondering if we should have called you up. Um, are, do you consider your school rural or not? I was wondering. So there are pocket, pockets of Stafford that are extremely rural. Um, mm -hmm. But overall, it's largely a suburb. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. And Dan, welcome. Oh, hi. Yeah, nice to be here. Um, I'm Dan Dornberg, a, a neighbor of Janae's. I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and um, I think I'm here sort of as a resource person for uh, the Black Lives Matter discussions on uh, my now comment tool. So uh, I'm not a teacher, but I'm just here to be helpful if, uh, if I can be. Yeah, you know what, Dan, I also appreciate your perspective, though, because, I mean, you wanted to, to make this tool out of uh, some desire to have sort of democratic discourse happening more. Wouldn't you say? I mean, yeah, do you absolutely. want to say that purpose again? Yeah, well, we're, we're a public interest group. Um, it's a, Now Comment is a, a totally free, it's open to everybody, there's no charge. Um, and the idea is to... It was originally designed with the um, with the 2008 election in mind as sort of a grassroots democracy political tool, and for the past eight years, it's been <laughs> been used increasingly uh, focused on education. But yeah, our, our mission is you know it, this is a project of fairness.com, and I'm I'm really happy to have it be used for topics like uh, Black Lives Matter. Great. So welcome. Thank you for coming, sure. Chris Rogers. Oh. Hey everybody, um, Chris Rogers in Philadelphia, um, by way of Chester PA, um, media and technology, and um, today I pulled out a special book to plug, it's called Killing Trayvons, it was put out by Counterpunch, a great website for articles, for like um, dissenting opinions and other great critiques, um, and it really encapsulates a lot of the conversations that happened during the 2012 moment of Trayvon Martin, and a lot of the same topics when you talk about structural reality are facing um, youth in Baltimore today. Um, so that's my recommendation for today, and I'm going to put it in the chat. And you'll tell us more? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Good. Okay. 
Great. And Al, welcome. Hey, how you doing? Always Al, nice to see you. Always nice to be seen. Uh, fifth grade educator uh, near Birmingham, Hoover, Alabama. And I, I was an algebra project facilitator. I like mean, oh, many moves ago, yeah, in uh, in Bessemer, Alabama, part of the Bessemer City Algebra Project. I remember going to Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and you know, Mississippi to Delta and all that. And and just to kind of chime in, like when I was trained and going through there, there's a very, I guess, idea that education is kind of the new civil rights, and that was kind of the idea uh, when Bob Moses developed the the program. He, we had his kids in mind and how they were being kind of left behind. It was calling it the transitional curriculum to properly transition to a way of algebraic thinking. Um, I think now they call it more of a constructivist. You know, it's, it's kind of what it is. But the way we learn to read is kind of in a real environment. Like you see a bird before you write the symbols B I R D on a piece of paper. In mathematics, a lot of times we jump straight to the symbolic representation. And so the algebra project was very heavily based on giving a real physical, you know, event and then the kids kind of create the symbolic representation to tell their stories, which is the mathematics. So they kind of create their own mathematics and then they're able to use those principles when they're learning high levels of mathematics. But uh yeah, I, I, that's kind of my first year teaching math. <coughs> Back in I guess '96 when I started, but anyway, that's me. I'm very I'm, I'm I'm glad to I guess meet you and yeah, that's very interesting. Cool. That's good. So and, and now when when you said when you said uh, that you were you were enthusiastic about coming on because you said you didn't like what you were seeing on the on the news uh, in the press and so forth. Well, Do you just I mean, briefly just, say what you had in mind when you said that. I guess ultimately I kind of look at it like. I think that everybody's against looting and rioting and destruction of property and you know you know crimes against neighborhoods. I think there's you know I I haven't met an advocate for any of those things. And so a lot of times you know when I see you know a lot of interviews now in the media, the only reason I'm watching the news right now is I'm waiting for them to say you know like when the police officers that was involved are turning themselves in. But when they're gonna be arrested, I don't ever see that, and then I'll see that the whole story is about behind the property is being destroyed, mm -hmm. right? And then the 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 conversation around using thug as a label, I am reminded that I have never heard the six officers referred to as anything but police officers. So it it, it becomes how the term thug starts to become defined and be okay when you know. They destroying insured property in a lot of cases, and I'm not endorsing it. But it was just kind of weird because I wasn't even looking for the riots. I'm waiting for the story, for the outrage surrounding, you know, the his the history of police brutality, not in necessarily just Baltimore, but just in the news generally. And the, the story has shifted to the riots, and you know, it was just kind of troublesome. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And Karen, introduce yourself and then we'll get going. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Karen. Um, I do work in sort of informal online community building and do some work with Paul with Youth Voices. And I'm here mostly just to listen and learn from you all tonight. So uh, can we keep going on this sort of like what's going on in Baltimore and just uh, as, you know, for us first, and then we'll think about it, impact on students and so forth. And um, Jay, you're right in the middle of it, so do you want to kind of give us your perspective of what's happening and what's it feeling like? And sure. What's it felt like for the last couple of weeks, I guess, really? Yeah, yeah well, I got to say, you know, um, it feels different day to day, that's, that's for sure. Hmm. Um, so I'm going to give um, today's feelings. Um, it's uh, incredibly exciting. We're uh, we're definitely moving. We're kind of racing through history at the moment mm -hmm. and speeding things up. And it's extremely powerful. And um, let me give you a couple of a couple of um, uh, sort of scenarios to think about uh, with this. So last night, um, the Algebra Project young people have offices. Uh, right downtown, right across from City Hall. Um, it's actually a pretty interesting location. They they rent from an online news cable news network, the Real News, which um, does some excellent reporting. Anyway, they share um, a floor with a group called Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, which is slightly older 
youth um, come from a, a policy debate background who've really been leading um, the black nationalist um, policy articulation in the city uh, for a couple of years now. And so this is, uh, there's a cl very close collaboration that's developed between the two groups. Um, and so they've um, got folks from a whole bunch of different um, areas and disciplines to come in to these offices um, over the last uh, few days um, and really, you know, make some plans for, for how to um, how to take uh, this as an opportunity to do some stuff. So last night there were simultaneously a public meeting with about 250 people in it um, in the upstairs of this office uh, space. Um, there was a training for marshals that was um, being march, you know, de demonstration marshals that was being led um, by youth, the, the, the public meetings led by youth. Um, there was a media team led by youth uh, that was working with people from the Advancement Project um, to uh, hit 200 news outlets with a daily message um, that the young people come up with first thing each morning. Um, and there was a um, strategy team that was, uh, oh, a strategy team and also a legal defense team. That was, this was all happening simultaneously in this building um, entirely um, through coordination of people in their, their teens and early 20s. Um, well, so, and, so these, are, these are kids from in high school. Well, there's high school kids and, and, and kids who've been in the algebra project and then gone to a local college or dropped out. Um, but it's that, that age, sort of, you know, 17 through 23. And Jay, I want to give everybody permission and warn you that uh, interruption is a, oh, is please, a please. way to go here. So Absolutely. Any quick thoughts on that? the picture that, that has already been sketched for us here? No, that's a beautiful struggle. That, that sounds great. Yeah. We need to duplicate that. Yeah. Uh, um, across the building, like just sort of in the next office space still within this real news thing, um, Eddie Conway's taken up residence, the, um, the Black Panther who spent 44 years in, in prison and was just released last year. He's been and, reporting a, a bit on democracy now. I've been picking right, up, but yeah, right. Go ahead. And, and a, a marvelous, marvelous um, um, space to be, you know, so close to him. And, and he's, he's, you know, seen all this stuff in Baltimore and, you know, 10 times worse you know, before, and so he's really got this perspective that he shares just very gently with um, with the young people. Anyway, that was yesterday, and um, today, um, can, I don't know. Can I ask, can, th that was provocative, the way you said that, though. Can, can I ask you to break that down? Can you paint that picture a little more? Like, an example of him sharing something with young people? Um, well, he doesn't really... Um, he doesn't really come to their space. He he um, he's sort of um, he does his, he does his thing, which is largely kind of hanging out with um, with people at the uh, Gilmore Homes, which is the project where uh, Freddie Gray was living. Um, he just kind of hangs out, but um, every once in a while, you know, they'll. Yeah, he did a out. series of interviews. Is that correct? Yeah. In yeah. Right. Go, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. And so you know, he'll just. Um, you know, just one of the one of the kids will just be over on you know the other side of the building for something. It's just you know different different addresses actually, but they'll be over for something, and they'll just talk a little bit, and he'll give some little bit of perspective to somebody, and then they're when they're just talking to their friends later, this this perspective sort of starts to seep through, and um, and it's always encouraging. It's always um, we don't have to be. Um, be thinking about what the other guy should do. Let's just think about what we should do, and let's do it. Right. And um, anyway, that's just sort of like part of the the flavor that we've got this real intergenerational capacity as well as this youth-led thing. And so today there was, um, I mean, at least on CNN uh, over dinner, um, this march that the young people. It was it was um, 
thought through by a couple of the college students, um, some from the algebra project, some from other places. Um, and it, you know, it was it was the the mobilization came from these meetings yesterday. I mean, all of this is very very fluid and fast. Um, and uh, there were thousands of people, and CNN was preoccupied with it. And there were um, sister marches in New York, Boston, and DC, as far as I know, um, tonight as well. And that I'm not saying that that's all just because of the algebra project by any means. I'm just saying that. Um, we're very excited about the opportunity that um, the uprising and uh, the, the aggressiveness of the young people in Baltimore gives for focusing attention on what um, you know, the, the people in Baltimore see as the real issues. Um, Jay, have you had a, a chance to um, sort of like get with your um, colleagues? So I'm, so what I'm thinking about is how do... How how does the how do the teachers like defend the students' ability to be able to like take part in this historic moment? Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, I mean it's a great question and, and you know it's um I don't have a, a simple or a short answer to yeah. it. Um because I, in the algebra project we really think of this as a many years process. Yeah. Um and the way Bob Moses talks about it, um, and Al, you probably heard this kind of language in, in um, before. You know, he talks about it as as building a crawl space. So you try to figure out how to protect the young people so that they can fashion their own insurgency. That's the the idea. And the crawl space that we use in the in the algebra project is mathematics um, because young people who are applying themselves to math, making a demand on themselves to learn math, making a demand on their peers uh, to participate in, in um, intensive math work during school, after school. Um, that demand results uh, in the capacity, eventually, in the capacity to um, organize themselves, for the young people to organize themselves to make demands on the larger society. And so the school system has, from time to time in Baltimore, this is, we've been doing this for about uh, 14 years now, 13 years, and the school system has often wanted to shut the thing down. But as soon as the young people get uh, in, in front of the press in any way, at a school board meeting or by holding a press conference or a rally or whatever they, they decide to do, um, they automatically get the public on their side be, and that embarrass the politicians because they're doing math. And, like, how can you say that they're not serious about education when they're doing math. I, we don't think, and this was really Bob, Bob Moses' genius um, in start, starting the Algebra Project in 80, 1982, we don't think that if they were doing poetry that they would succeed in being protected. Um, there's, there's no legitimate reason that they shouldn't succeed because they're doing poetry rather than mathematics. but the 21st century obsession with technology creates a crawl space under the rubric of math study. You know, I, um, you described those three demands on self, peers, and then on others, or they may be said slightly differently, but um, in your book so well. Um, and, and I was thinking, how different that perspective is, and I was wondering if you could even give more example and, and talk about that more, how different that is from the debate between respectability politics and, you know, revolutionary politics, <laughs> you know, like, um, it's, it, it seems like that's what we have to choose, like, we have to choose either to be on the side of violence or on this, you know, of the people in the street doing looting, or we have to be on the side of respectability politics where you have to you know, keep your pants up. And it, and it feel that's, if, it's a really false dichotomy, and I think the kind of demands that, that you were talking about there on self-peers and then, and then others as it develops is a really great perspective to break that dichotomy down. Is that a fair analysis? Or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, maybe somebody else would like to yeah. comment on that. 
You guys know what we're talking about here? <laughs> <laughs> you saying, yeah, like when you said dichotomy, dichotomy between what again? Between I don't know what being violent it. or 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 being peaceful. I mean, like I think that uh, like a lot of times because we're always giving things in like you know red and blue fashion, right? Like you know, Democrat or Republican, Autobot, Septicon, right? Or like whatever. It's it's always a a yin and a yang, but it's really not like that. Like 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 we live in a world of nuance. Right, like everything is gray, you know what I'm saying? Like if you if you go back far enough, if you really think, okay, so okay, I was thinking about this today. Fraternal organizations have culture, right? Like I I know some people that like are in certain fraternities, and I've met people in that same fraternity that generationally they were different, but the organization has a certain characteristics, right? So I think education is kind of like that. There are certain teachers, if you've been teaching over a certain period of time in a certain area, you know, you, you probably think alike on, on certain issues, okay? So when I, thought, when I thought it, I was thinking of the relationship between, let's say, the police departments and black people in this country. And if you really think of, the, of how it started, you know, police departments were formed to protect property. And once upon a time in this country, black people were considered property, and the only people that can really own property were white men. So this organization started, this organization has a culture of and a certain relationship with black people. So, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, what, late 1800s? So a hundred and something years ago, it was okay to lock me up for nothing. So a hundred and so years later, when police departments historically have always had a problem with people of color, it's not necessarily surprising, but we need to understand that that is the problem, right? Like, you don't solve that by pulling up pants. You don't solve that by speaking the king's English, right? That that doesn't get fixed if, if we hold the same kind of signs and we sign a petition. That gets fixed by acknowledging that's how it became a problem. And now that's how the problem became real. Now we can start thinking about some actionable steps to go in a different direction. But as long as we act like it's just color or we act like it's just, you know, societal or socioeconomic status or if it's just education, the the unemployment rate in the area that we're talking about is like fifty percent I think for blacks. So in Baltimore. In Baltimore, right? It's like it's it's like fifty percent. That's a problem. You know, like the drop bar rate is, is not and and a lot of those conditions existed before anybody decided to sag pans or rob something like those problems existed and those problems had an effect on the community that lived there and, and we're thinking about it as this last horrible murder by the police there are the Baltimore Police Department has like you know payouts for wrongful death lawsuits because of other you know questionable things or whatever whatever so that community is exhausted of a treatment over a period of time and so that's kind of the thing is it, it's like a lot of times when, when I hear people talk about solutions, it starts with, with a group of people that has been victimized, what they need to do. This, and, 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 they, and there aren't things that they need to do, right? I'm, I'm trying to figure out things that I need to do to contribute to the solution. At the same time, there are other things that are contributing to the problem that I think should at least be talked about, right, sometimes. But I don't know. This is me. No, no, no. You, I, you're <laughs> not going to leave it like that. Right on. Question, <laughs> Janae, or you go ahead, jump yeah, in. I'll just add on to um, what I was saying. I think, I think Jay, like perfect outlines in his book when he talks about sort of like those everyday forms of resistance that young people are um, sort of like showing in classrooms, uh, in communities, and so. And I, I, I this is a, a quote that I put on my um, Facebook of how. How sort of like the same strategies that the young people are used to sort of like push back against all these structural conditions and realities that they're, they're facing are the same reasons that the power structure uses to say this is the reason why you can be locked up. This is the reason why you, sh you should be. Um, like I was reading this thing crazy. You're talking about Bessemer too, Al, uh, that when black people couldn't get um, like a, a seat on in the front of the bus, it was, it was a lot of cursing that would happen on the bus. It would just curse out, curse out the bus driver. And through that, 
the, the, the police force started locking up people for cursing. And I just, I just always think about how young people are always showing their power. And we need to be more, um, we need, we, we need to be more uh, observant of that, and not really be so preoccupied with these like, um, so sort of like crazy moments of like, yes, the CBS or the, uh, uh, the, the, the one time that, uh, or the, the, the video, and making sure that the, um, the footage of the cops and when, when did he hit him or is he standing up? I think we're so preoccupied with that that we miss sort of like those, those everyday moments. And that's something I've, I've really been trying to emphasize lately is how, how do we begin to unearth those everyday moments and those really like slow, slow tragedies that, that you can't really, um, that, that have to unravel over time. Um, like a, a, lot of, a lot of talk is around sort of like urban renewal, the urban renewal program in, in Baltimore and like and how that sort of like um, you talk about sort of like um, displacing communities. And then bring on top of that sort of like housing policy and how that also worked into it. So those like slower tragedies that lead lead up to these lead up to this moment, while at the same time recognizing that people have always been resisting in in, in different ways. In some ways, have been criminalized because um, cops are seeing them resist and want to sort of like control and contain that. Um, but always. These things are happening, and uh, so when I, when I think about like the protests, and I think about how the media is covering it, they're really looking for like the loud moments. And um, I think one of, one of the things that we need to begin to focus on, especially in our classrooms, is to um, teach people to really look at the, the slow the slow parts, because that's where that's where the, the the strategic and the structural stuff really starts to creep in our communities, and it, it doesn't really boil over. And when it boils over, that's when everyone says, "Ah, look at that moment." But as you were saying, I was like, it's really a buildup, and watching that buildup over time is really important. And teaching that, teaching that skill about recognizing the buildup is really important. And <clears throat> I mean, Chris was talking about you know the the slow, <clears throat> excuse me, the 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 slow manifestations of 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 this, but I. Um, it's really important to also notice the subtle, um, and and how the the subtleties are also very radical. Um, I I don't know if any of you all on Twitter follow Feminista Jones, but she was talking about uh, just the subtlety of of black organizing over the years, and she mentioned um, Detroit, how um, black people organized around this idea of bumping of not moving out of the way of a white person when they were approaching them um, because there is sort of this you know socialization that if you are a black person a person of color you need to step aside it's the thing that we just maybe innately do maybe we don't um, and that subtlety um, was really empowering and and uh, just how that um, manifests, manifests in a new, like, unfelt sort of way of agency. Um, very recently in my classrooms, I've seen students having very, my students of color, rather, having very courageous conversations around race um, to the point where I've now made a point of it to step outside of my classroom, um, you know, while class change is happening, and allow the students to come in, and I'll have something on the, you know, projected on the screen, like maybe it'll be something about a protest, or maybe it'll be something about a strike that's happening, and just let the kids talk. Um, whereas before, I would try to, you know, make it less problematic, or like try to structure it more, but kids, my students are so, it, so it's kind of like um, the, what is her name, Marion uh, Marian Williamson quote, the, you know, you let your light shine and other people see it and they are like, oh, I can, I have a light, I can do that too. Um, I, I think, you know, kids Students being so connected via Tumblr, via Twitter, they're like, oh, you're only 16? 
um, Amandala St Stenberg, and you're talking about appropriation and America loving, uh, you know, black culture, but not loving black people. Oh, you're only 16. I can do that too. Um, and and finally being able to to talk when we're talking about you know to kill a mockingbird and 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 not feeling like they have to not be the controversial person in the room. So it's it's really really cool just to see students say like stuff that that involves race, whereas bef maybe a few months ago they would be just completely silent. So that's a really cool thing to experience. How, how do you think that's happening? Is it because of, you know, Ferguson and now Baltimore and everything in between? Um, I really think it's everything in between because, you know, when I... I had when I had discussions with my classes in the beginning of the year in September about Ferguson. Mm -hmm. My students of color very very silent, um, and the ones that did speak up were very much so harping on respectability politics and you know why are they angry and they shouldn't be angry in this way. Um, but now these same students are like, wait, but they're justified. You know these things. There's been, you know, all these things piling up over the years, um, generations, rather, um, and they're justified. And I think, I don't know, I, I really think it is just that it's a very pervasive thing at this point. So no matter what, you know, area of Twitter you're part of, no matter what community of Tumblr you're part of, there's something that is being discussed about Baltimore. There's something being discussed about police brutality, positive or negative. So everyone's checking out everyone's opinions. Um, <clears throat> but I, I don't know. I think, you know what, I, I was actually thinking, like, it's sort of the way the internet works. Like, like I saw this uh, this TED talk, and he was talking about these search bubbles, meaning that if I Google something and somebody on the other side of the world, world Googles the exact same thing, we may not get the exact same results. And so being able to do that, if I find one police brutality, then the way the Internet works, I'm going to find other things similar to that topic. And I think because there's so much more information, it used to just be scattered, right? Like there's an explosion of police videos, but I, 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 I want to caution everybody thinking that that means this is a new phenomenon. Right. Like now we can see it, but it doesn't mean that, you know, it, these are the only bad cops, the ones that are on tape. Right. So I think that is, you know, kind of important to, to kind of understand that like young people, the whole the way the Internet works and like reality TV has, I think, played out. And now people are just kind of getting back to reality in some instances. Like, like they are connected with people on the other end of that camera. Now, whoever caught that film video, you know, whoever video it is a star, right? Like, world star hip-hop is are videos from people. Like, YouTube is a thing because it connects to, you know, regular people. And I think that's the age that we're living in, and anybody can kind of start a movement. That is empowering to think of, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Jay. No, no, that's okay. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, I was going to say, and I think one of, one of the things when you when you brought up the internet and something I've been really trying to emphasize, um, like in a subversive way with the with uh, my, I was with the seventh graders, is that this is a global moment, and that the, the young black people are in a a globe. This really is a global struggle, and when you, when you think about um, what I was trying to get them to connect is how. Not like we think about police brutality, but you also think about the police as a form of state power, right? Like the U.S. and how that connects to like um, when, we, when we talk about foreign policy and how that connects to um, uh, situations such as Palestine, situations such as Afghanistan, where you have drones flying around and like don't, they aren't even human beings, right? Uh, in America, it's it's a you know usually a white man who's doing this. But in Afghanistan, this is a autonomous drone that no one even like doesn't have a human face to it. But it you know drop it drops bombs, kills a number of civilians, and then in the media was it it was reported the same way that we that was uh, happened in the Freddie Freddie Gray, where they talk about well look at look at look at their arrest record or look at the arrest record of this area, and it's justified in that way, and like really starting to make that connection between. 
that this is, yes, this is unique and, and it has a singular history in Baltimore. But this history um, is connected to a global struggle and it is right. a historic global struggle so that the young people not only see themselves within the moment and not and don't really connect this to like this is an American issue. This is really a global issue. And well, you know, I national um, moments. I just want to say, and somewhere in between, um, maybe is um, I was working with a young man who's not here very long from from Dominican Republic, and he's studying a Wikipedia article about Amadou Diallo, and um, in his notes. He started talking about something that happened to one of his friends and he, from, a, from a cop, and, and so I started talking to him about it, and he said, yeah, that happened back in my country, right? So it, it's um, so scratching the surface with, with young people who are here from other countries, um, I, think, I think makes your point really clear, Chris, about how it is a global issue as well. But it's actually like, you know, just kind of the chime on that too, like mm -hmm. the society that we live in now is is kind of the remnants of a European desire to control the world. Like this is what this is what happens when they're able to set up colonies everywhere and decide how the resources are going to be distributed, how the laws are going to be written, how the languages are going to be spoken, how the clothes are going to be worn, how beauty is going to be defined. This is the result. This is the society. This is the world that you get. Like and 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 that is a global phenomenon because you know every the English is spoken in a lot of places other than England, right? <laughs> I mean, it just is, you know. And and it's not an accident. And 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 so to actually look at the results of things that happened a hundred years ago. I, I I narrated this this political film. It's called Open Secret. And the film is about the 1901 Constitution of Alabama, what happens to be the longest constitution in the world because of the number of times it was amended. But the entire documentary that I'm narrating is based on the notes that they took at the Constitutional Convention. And they're actually using language that says, our purpose is to set up white supremacy in the state of Alabama. How they went about segregating the schools. How they went about writing up the, the laws. How that election actually had more black votes than black registered voters, right? And they all voted for their own disenfranchisement. That is still the Constitution of Alabama right now, right? And so what I'm saying is we are literally living the results of a world that they set up at a time when it was okay to think of black people in Australia as flora and fauna. That's the original <laughs> aboriginal people there. So how do you fix that problem, right? Like, how do you fix that problem and keep all the CVSs? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, how do we how do we fix that and no police cars get hurt? I don't I don't know I don't get it, <laughs> but I mean it's got to be a way, and I I want to find that way too. Can Can I? Um, yeah, maybe maybe you can do whatever you'd like, Jake. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I just great great conversation and um. So let's take the, um, you know, the burning police cars and, and throwing rocks and stuff. Um, we, we see this as, um, I don't know, we, I, I see it as um, something that happened, probably will happen again. And it's not a thing by itself. Those aren't things by itself. They're also things with... Um, you know, kids meeting and talking about what's going on. Maybe just talking about what's going on because they don't have people around who are um, in a position to help them structure a strategy. Wow. But then other kids who are in a position to structure a strategy. Wow. And um, so when we talk about this demand on peers, what we're really talking about is um, how does a group of people develop a culture, not just randomly, but wow. develop a culture with a certain amount of uh, intention and a certain amount of choice. Not completely chosen, but partially chosen. Wow. Not completely just inherited from, from the past and from media. Partly inherited and partly created. How, how does that happen? And in, in Bob Moses' teaching, a, a key element to this is 
um, working with people so they see themselves as performing in public, of acting in a public space, as opposed to just in a private space or just in a segregated space, but a public space that anybody can be a part of. And I can be a part of it too. And my peers can be a part of it too. And for us, this is why the, the action on the street is so important and maybe more important now than ever with electronic media. Um, because, you know, when you're just in your own, um, you know, social media sphere or on your own phone call, um, you know, yeah, anybody in the world can see what you're doing, but not that many people do see what you're doing. And mm -hmm. so there's, it tends to be that there's just, you know, your peer group knows everything, but another peer group knows nothing. Wow. So when you get out on the street, then you have the potential that there's, uh, you know, Al, actually, it's like in the in the math teaching. There's a common physical experience that everybody right. shares when you're out in the street. So um, now then there's, you know, the way media tells stories and so on. But then you got to get out in the street some more so that you can be performing your own story rather than just letting it go away. And learn and, how to tell your own. We'll go ahead, but yeah. Yeah, so the, the thing is that the process of being in the street and then going back and reflecting and making a new plan and getting back out in the street or at, uh, you know, the legislature or creating your own legislature, a parallel institution like the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was and like many, many institutions are today, parallel institutions to existing things. That process, that cycle um, generates a new culture with its own formal standards and what's going to happen, I, you know, I'm a real optimistic person, so what's going to happen is that this new culture is not going to be speaking the English that's in the textbooks today as correct. It's not going to be teaching the history that's in the textbooks today. It's not even going to be teaching the mathematics that's in the textbooks today. It's going to be a new culture that solves the problems for the young people that they face because they come up with the solutions. I like it. Yeah. And on, the, I got another plug. Um, so this one's called <laughs> Another Politics by Chris Dixon. And I your library, Christopher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want to go to Whitney Shoe uh, bookstore in Philly. I'm using <laughs> like eighty dollars or so. But this one really gets at um, that exactly what you're saying, and what the term he uses is prefigurative politics. Uh -huh. How through through these sort of like circles, young people are beginning to sort of like note the new rules of of what what this new world needs to be. Right. And um, yeah, it's beautiful, and like you you see it coming together. And you see people are arguing about, and to me, one of the best parts is people are arguing about it in public. Yeah. Are, uh, these these questions of, like, intersectionality and gender and queer issues and trans issues and how the people are arguing about these in public and where, where do we need to be? And it's it's beautiful, and it's going to come together to really create something nice. It might take a while, you know what I'm saying, to really get up there, but it's, it's, it's there, and you can see it today, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I I'll just jump in for just almost a tangential comment maybe, but I, I was I was thinking while you were talking that um, you know t today I get yesterday was the um, a Supreme Court uh, talking about uh, gay marriage, and the 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 progress from you know the Stonewall riots in in just a relatively few years is just absolutely unbelievable. Um, I I would never five years ago seven years ago never have thought things would come this quickly and um, it, it seems to me that the maybe it is because of the internet and so many videos you know Trayvon Martin and you know and Ferguson and, and just just one thing after another after another after another but it, it really does feel to me like like something has changed there is a, a much more real dialogue and and a, a lot more soul-searching going on in the country than there was before when Say Rodney King had, you know, that experience, and then, you know, I, I I can't think of anything that kind of captured the country the same way for another X number of years. You know, 
it happened, I'm sure, thousands of times, but it wasn't a national conversation, one thing after another after another. So uh, I'm also very optimistic. Yeah, I, I mean, I would kind of go back and say I think it's always been a national conversation. I just think we didn't have the, the media tools that we have today to be able to capture it. But um, I think it's, all, it, it's always been there. You know, I, and, and if you haven't heard, I think it was this week's This American Life, I, I always hear it light, but there's, there's one about change. Um, and from a political point of view, it's really interesting, I think, because uh, I'll ruin it for you just briefly. But, um, Thank you. The study, the study that, they, that they, they looked for, they looked into was, uh, it, it ends up that um, uh, gay people could go out in California around Proposition 8 and change people's views about, about that issue. Um, and, and those views in a particular kind of way, which you'll have to hear them break down. Um, and, and, then, and then women who around abortion issues um, had the same kind of ability to change. And, and the, ring, the reason I bring it up it, it is it is about getting out there and having dialogue with people and, and really talking about and hearing where they're coming from and, and coming back with, well, here's my story. Um, so I thought I think it was a really interesting piece in all this too. I'm, I also want to make a note that as I was clicking off boxes, I don't know Karen and I and, and others here too, but are involved in you know this uh, connected educator movement and um, some of the things you've been saying about getting public, about intergenerational, about you know peers working with peers. I mean some of that stuff that you're talking about happening in offices and streets and so forth um, is, is the goal of that movement too. And I don't know what to do with that, but, but that, that's kind of exciting, I think, and interesting um, kind of connections that are possible. Jay, we have like five minutes left. I, I want to kind of come back to you and say, where is this going to go? I mean, I, I, I threw CNN on, CNN on just to see what they were talking about. Um, and I mean, and they they they're like tamping down Friday already, right? They're saying we're not going to learn anything on Friday, um, and I'm sure that they're not doing that themselves. They've been sort of told to do that. So you know that there's there's not going to be a big report. Nothing's going to happen Friday. But how how do you see the rest of the week going? Or or well, I, whatever you're thinking here, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I'm I'm hoping for for more mass actions over the you know the course of the next uh, couple of weeks, and I know there's some some uh, fa fascinating great um, organizers in the Latino and immigrant community are planning a major demonstration in East Baltimore. Uh, most of the most of the damage um, Monday was in West Baltimore, but so there's uh, this group for Friday regardless of whatever is reported or not reported. And then the young people have another plan for a, a major demonstration Saturday um, to really, um, you know, bring stuff to the, um, back to, to City Hall. So, th and that kind of thing, you know, that's going to be thousands of people again, and maybe who knows, you know, what that'll look like. But I think there's a more important uh, issue, which is the longer term, and um, I won't take a long time, but um, just so here's just sort of a, a, a way to think about this. What I'm really hoping for out of this uh, work that's going on now um, is that we get a program for uh, year-round youth employment. So there's a summer youth employment program um, in place that never serves as many young people as it should. Greatly shrunk from the 1960s. Um, when it when it started, um, because it's not so much white kids who are getting, it and you can lock them up instead of give them a job, and other people make money. So that's happened. But so there's there's a summer employment program. But w w what the young people really say they need is year-round employment. Mm. And I think that and people in, in Baltimore, young people, have been making this case for for uh, ten years now, without a really good response um, at all. But uh, this organizing could easily go in the direction of like opening some doors for some things to happen 
um, that actually appeal to the fear of the power structure. Um, you know, let's yeah, maybe if we give these guys some some jobs, they'll get off the street and um, stop putting so much pressure on us. I got I gotta um, say that feels so good compared to we got to do something, you know, which is what we hear so much of. Yeah, yeah. And, well, the the youth jobs thing is enormous, and mm -hmm. it, it really to me it really underpins the educational system that um, we found by the Algebra Project Youth have earned close to, it's getting close to three million dollars now in the past uh, 13 years um, teaching math and sharing self-advocacy skills with their peers and um, what the, the reason they've been able to build their own culture and do so much political activity is because they actually know that they can you know buy dinner afterwards and they actually feel good when they go home because they can contribute a little cash to the family to keep the lights on or or you know just buy their own clothes um, and that lets them think about some other things apart from how they're going to get the next dollar and just that little bit of relief um, has been huge for allowing organizing to take place and so if we could use this moment uh, to really force um, the city and more than that the state and the federal government um, to pay a ridiculously small amount of money to employ every young person in Baltimore that wants a job it would be a huge organizing base both for politics and for education yeah and I, um, like subversively I hope that we can uh, use that moment as a way when we have these kids working and getting paid to say hey but there's more that we can do you know and have that breathing room, that crawl space that you were talking about, to really start to take this to a, another level while they're getting paid too. That's that project as well. Exactly. Jay, Jay, at the end of your book, you you refer to connections between Philadelphia and Baltimore and the student organizations in both of those cities. Is that still happening? Do you know or? Yeah, um, actually, a uh, uh, so um, young person from Youth United for Change just arrived in Baltimore a couple hours ago, and um, I think she's at the office right now planning some um, um, enjoyable activities for tomorrow, I, I'm expecting, yeah. So that, yeah, that's definitely going on. There's uh, People are linked by something called the National Student Bill of Rights. There's a lot of organizing about that in Philadelphia, um, Baltimore, uh, Atlanta, Oakland, different places. So, um, yeah, there are definitely still connections. Yeah, and there's a rally being planned overnight tonight in Philly um, at City Hall, 4:30. So Wonderful. the connections is coming, like you said. Wonderful. I like I like the whole like uprising. So we yeah. got like Philly uprising. Yeah, um, we're trying to get in. Yeah. Next. Um, I. Oh, uh, I guess we're done, huh? No, we're not done. You're still here. I, I, I just wanted to say about no, the no, job. No, don't, thing. don't worry about the time. I mean. Okay. I just, well, just want to respect quick, your time. Go ahead. No, no, no. Just a quick thing about uh, what you said, Chris, about the job thing. That when when we talk about jobs uh, in this context, we're talking about peer-to-peer -peer enterprises. So mm -hmm. what that means is uh, it's things like the algebra project structure, where young people are sharing knowledge or skills with peers, and where young people are actually um, the managers of the enterprise so that um, you know they can actually manage their own enterprises and um, it's the fact that they control them and learn to um, you know sometimes it's called solidarity economy but learn to do um, democracy in the workplace um, and to do it on a base of knowledge and knowledge knowledge based work which includes physical work but that that transcends physical work um, that's what we're after. So we're not just after kids getting any old job. We're after kids getting jobs that they control so that they can change their material circumstances. Cooperative economics. That's right, right, all the way, yep. Janae, you, I want to give you a chance to say, and then I'm going to try to follow up with you. Uh, you, you hope your your own students are going to be talking about some of this tomorrow, is that correct? Um, so we're going to have to push it back to next week. Um, okay. <clears throat> but because I really want to give it the space and, and yeah. the thought that I, I would like to give it. Um, but a few of my students, we were talking about, um, so our janitorial staff across the county is on strike right now, um, which, wow, 
amazing um, for higher wages. Um, and in talking about that, um, a few of my students were like, well, why aren't we talking about Baltimore? And I was like, y'all called me out. Good. I'm glad you did that. Um, so, uh, you know, we talked about the questions that they had and um, discussed, you know, maybe bringing in a few people via Google Hangout to talk with us. So if any of you all are interested in, in having that chat with us, it'll probably be on Monday. Um, but, uh, yeah, they have a lot of amazing questions about the language that's being used to shape the dialogue about Baltimore Uprising and, and the rioters versus the looters versus uh, protesters, you know, all this language um, and why, why that's important. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, they, they just want to talk about it, um, and I love that they want to talk about it, so mm -hmm. just trying to help facilitate that, that space or create that space so they can facilitate it. So we'll check with you. Um, I mentioned in an email that we're going to be hooking up and um, on Friday via Google Hangout um, at it's a, your East Coast. Right? Yeah, you're, um, at, so it's 1.50. Um, and if you want to get we found that a few students works better than you know a whole class kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So and you know if they're really interested to talk to, so if you want to kind of test it out, yeah, you're welcome to do that. And then we'll we'll follow up with you on Monday perhaps too. So we'll, we'll figure things out. But let's let's connect. Yeah. Um, Jay, any kind of final thoughts here tonight? Just you know, what a wonderful conversation! I'm I'm so thrilled to you know meet you guys and renew my acquaintance with Chris, and uh, it's it's just really really fantastic to get to to do this. I, I um what a what a group! Wow. Well, thank you, and um, I totally recommend your book. I um I sent you I, I said in the email that uh, Burke and Allison uh -huh. and Ella Baker and and um, Bob Moses, those are like really important signposts in my life too. So it was, it's great to see all those things together. And if you think about Burke, you know, and drama, and and put that in the con, you know, put the the quote unquote looting in the context of a drama. There's a, it's really interesting. Right? Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Chris, Chris's library. <laughs> there we go. I probably have some like historic uh, Baltimore uprising protesters. <laughs> um, educating for insurgency copy. So excited about that. Put that in the museum. All right. <laughs> Clearly, we're going to continue these kinds of conversations. Um, we will be back here um, doing something around all this next week. Uh, we're here every Wednesday night. Um, okay. This is show 440. Um, and um, I'd love for you to get, like, is, is there any way to, is there anybody showing what's going on with those young people in that in that office building? That That's amazing. That, that yeah. That was a great story. Somebody yeah. should be, yeah. It, it, yeah, well, we'll work on that. That's a good idea. You don't want too many cameras in there, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. All right. They should be holding them themselves. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all okay. for hanging out tonight. Um, and uh, we do this uh, at edtechtalk.com, um, which is a channel of the World Bridges Network that Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier set up many years ago. Thank you all, and good thank, night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.